So, uh, Sam received his degrees from Ben Gurion University of Negev in Israel and was a postdoc at uh, MIT working with Yuri Boyansky and uh, Guy Bressler and, and others. And uh, he has had impact on a remarkable uh, breadth of problems, including the shine capacity of easy models, uh, information theoretic security, where he solved the problem in uh, wiretap channels. And more recently, he's been looking at uh, estimating information measures in high dimensions and applying this to uh, learning dynamics and deep neural networks. And uh, new for this academic year, he is here at Cornell in ECE. So we can now count him as a colleague. So uh, join me in welcoming to Goldfeld to the applied math uh, ecosystem here at Cornell. Mm -hmm. As you can see, I'll be talking about this notion of Gaussian smooth optimal transport, uh, which, as we will see in some very precise sense, um, enjoys the best of several different worlds. That. And uh, if you have never heard about optimal transport before, let me just say, you know, bear with me, no worries, because I really tried to build this thing so that we can accumulate the background we need as we go along, at least to an extent. Though, if you are familiar with optimal transport, what I'd like to say is what this Gaussian smoothing effectively allows you to do is to retain some of the most beneficial properties of this framework, which is, for example, its metric structure under the Wasserstein uh, metric example, while alleviating what is possi possibly the greatest deficiency here, uh, which has to do with this cursive dimensionality business that uh, really deals with how just empirically hard it is to approximate optimal transport from samples, from data in high dimension. Right now, um, if you're sort of wondering, fine, but why should I care about optimal transport or its horrible high dimensional sum of complexity? Well, beyond being, um, in my mind at least, a beautiful uh, mathematical theory, in recent years, optimal transport found lots of applications and uh, gained a lot of attention from machine learning community, especially for building generative adversarial networks, which are the state of the art systems as far as generative modeling goes. And this is, in a sense, where this story of ours begins. So uh, as a brief outline, I'll start by describing uh, what is a generative adversarial network, GAN, for short. Uh, show you the connection uh, of GANs to optimal transport, and again, to be a bit more precise to the particular case of the Wasserstein metric. We'll see some properties of this metric and understand what makes it so appealing for building GANs in the first place, though on top of that will also surface this main practical bottleneck of the cursive dimensionality, um, at which point I'll touch upon what is um, sort of the most popular go-to solution that is currently out there in the literature as far as the cursive dimensionality goes, which is entropic optimal transport, but we'll see that while uh, moving from the classic framework to the entropic one indeed speeds up um, the empirical approximation convergence rate, the price being paid for that is pretty high. Um, at least in terms of when you go from classic to entropic, you lose a bunch of properties that made you consider optimal transport in the first place in some sense. Um, and this will pretty much cover the current state of, of, of affairs, at which point I will present this new idea of uh, Gaussian smooth optimal transport and will argue that um, you, in some sense, lose nothing by moving to this Gaussian smooth regime, but while doing so, you will alleviate the curse of dimensionality. And I'm, I'm personally very excited about this idea. <laughs> you listen to the talk, you what you think uh, once we're done. OK, so to um, kick things off, let me try and give you a flavor of motivation for why GANs are, in fact, a fascinating system to reason about. And to do this, I would like to just show you how outstanding their capability is in generating synthetic samples that look everything like real world data. And to do that, um, let me show you these two images of cases and say that not both of, of these images are real, where a real image for me is an actual human being whose picture is being taken, while a fake image would be just a grid, a grid of pixels generated by a computer, now a real person in the background. In some sense, you can think of this as white noise being pushed through some fancy function, and this is what you get on the other end. Right. Maybe to um, test our own ability in distinguishing fake from real, why don't we have a quick poll here? I'll just poll one. So, okay, 
if you guys think, or whoever thinks that this uh, guy on the left is the fake one, not a real human being, completely synthesized by a computer, why don't you show me your hand? All right, how about the lady on the right? Yeah, so pretty even, right? And for a good reason, because this is what you would call a cheap brick, both of these are fake. Uh, <laughs> um, but beyond, yeah, beyond being a cheap brick, I mean, looking at this, at least for me, this is completely mind blowing, right? Because how just high resolution and detailed those images are, if it's wrinkles or pigmentation or defects in teeth or whatever else, this is completely indistinguishable to at least this human eye uh, from being real world images. And, um, you know, in the background of both of these synthetic samples is a generated adversarial network that produced uh, as, as its output. So, I mean, hopefully it at least gives us a sense that whatever system is capable of doing that is worth understanding, uh, which is to an extent what we're trying to do here. How fake yeah. is it? Like, there's no person who looks like that? Yeah, there is no person who looks like that. That's a mush of a bunch of data points that this network was trained with. And, you know, is it the same network that built those two pictures? Yes. So they, these are outputs of what's called progressively growing gas. Yeah. All right, so maybe just to put things in their uh, right context, let me mention that uh, GANs fall under uh, the uh, framework or canopy of unsupervised learning, where we get a bunch of IID, uh, d dimensional IID uh, data points from some underlying data distribution, Px, right? You should think of these as, as a set of images of faces, for example. And as opposed to supervised learning, no labels here whatsoever. And what we're trying to do with this data is learn, roughly speaking, some underlying structure, which in the context of generative modeling amounts to using this data to produce some approximating distribution Q, which in some proper sense uh, is close to the data distribution of interest. And let me say that when I say produce an approximating distribution Q, I do not necessarily mean that we're gonna have some explicit formula or structure for that approximating Q, but I do, to the very least, assume that we're able to sample from it, which is what GANs are actually doing, all right? And yeah, there are a bunch of different examples of unsupervised learning tasks, and I will not touch any of these uh, beyond generative models, and even more so, I'll focus on this specific uh, construction that is based on a generative adversarial network, about which I like to think as being the sample-to-sample -sample kind of system, in the sense that upon getting our data set, we're going to implicitly learn this appro approximating distribution Q. Again, implicit, not explicit, we won't have it structured, but we will then sample this implicit distribution to go directly from data samples to generated ones, hence this sample to sample uh, name. And just this amazing uh, ability of GANs to produce, you know, high quality, crisp images, make them found, find lots and lots of applications in many different uh, tasks, and this is a very non-comprehensive list, I would say that some of these applications are very important and go way beyond just coloring bags and stuff like that, okay, so, uh, yeah, yeah, so you draw some contour of, of, of whatever, right, the bag or, or a dress, for example, and you turn again, help you, you know, fill this up and look like something like this. All right, and with that said, let me tell you a bit about how GANs are, in fact, constructed, which is pretty much summarized in this block diagram over here, but I can slowly parse it, starting from our resources, uh, and well, unsupervised learning, so of course we get our IID, d-dimensional data set uh, from this underlying data distribution Px. But on top of that, I want to assume that we have access to some random seed noise, if you will, which should be thought of as some cheap form of randomness that we're going to transform into our synthetic generated sample. And for simplicity, I'm assuming that this random seed in this case is a p-dimensional Gaussian, though other models are possible as well. Though what is true in general is that the dimensionality of this seed is typically much smaller than the dimension of the space in which the data set resides. All right. Now, the way we are going to transform this noise into the generated sample is basically by pushing it through a generator map, which is nothing but a deep neural network, G theta, theta being the parameters, that expands p-dimensional vectors, random seeds, into d-dimensional vectors, again, the space where the data set lives. And the output of this generator network is basically what we're going to call our synthesized or generated or fake 
sample. So let's give it a name, maybe this xg, which is just g sub theta operating on z, right? Good. Now, of course, if you push random noise through a randomly uh, initialized generated network, you're going to get complete garbage on the other end. But the idea is that we're going to optimize the parameters of this generated network so as to make the distribution of this generated sample, which I'll call this q sub xg of data, as close as possible to our px, to our underlying data distribution. And to make this as close as possible statement precise, what we're going to do is effectively make our generator pass a certain test with respect to a second deep neural network we have here called the discriminator network. We know that by p sub p, p being the parameters, that sort of acts like a funnel mapping d-dimensional vectors to a real number with the goal that the outputs it assigns to inputs that come from the true data distribution as opposed to outputs it assigns to fake inputs well, these outputs should be maximally different from one another. Thus, this network indeed acts as some uh, discriminator uh, between what's real and what's fake. And if you just you know, think um, one more minute about these contrasting goals of the generator and discriminator, you understand that what we arrive at here is this min-max game formulation that basically looks as follows. So let me take the expected value of the discriminator output when fed with a real image. Subtract from that the expected value of the discriminator fed with a fake image, and because the discriminator wants to make this difference as large as possible, this would correspond to just supervising the difference over the parameters of the discriminator network, which would give us the best discriminator for a given, or if you will, a, as a function of the generator network. But because our end game here is to really come up with a generator that is able to beat even the best discriminator out there, what we should do is further infamize this entire thing uh, over the parameters of the generator network, which really brings us to this minimax game formulation that is at the heart of any GAN system uh, that is out there. This is correct. Yeah. Uh, what keeps the, the generator from just contracting to one good simple? Mm -hmm. so it's a good point that in practice it oftentimes does, which is called mode collapse. Called what? Mode collapse. Yeah. Uh, so this is one problem. And I mean, there's a bunch, of course, I will cover all of them. All right. Um, yeah, but basically, once you have that, um, what you do is call this up on your computer, iteratively train your generator and discriminator network until convergence, and you know, if everything works out well, you just sit back and uh, relax and enjoy the samples you're getting, uh, which should be pretty good. All right. So that's how you build GAN. Yeah. But to show you how this thing is connected to optimal transport, which is sort of what we're going for here, um, I would like to adopt a slightly more principled approach towards this generated modeling task that goes back to uh, the notion of statistical divergences, all right? Which should be thought of as mathematical objects that are capable of measuring the distance or the proximity between two probability distributions, right? And you can sort of imagine how this would very much relate what the generated modeling is all about. Right. So to set this up, let me give a name to the set of all um, d-dimensional distributions. This would be my p of r to the d. And I will call delta a statistical divergence if it takes as inputs a pair of probability distributions, fits out a real non-negative number such that it is zero if and only if my distributions are the same. Now if you, on top of that, you get that your statistical divergence is also symmetric and satisfies the triangle inequality, what you get is a metric on the space of probability measures, which immediately sort of endows the space with a bunch of geometry. And more importantly, I would say, enables us to exploit some very powerful machinery that we have for analysis of our metric spaces to analyzing whatever system we end up building from a statistical divergence that is in fact a metric. Okay, so a very beneficial and good property uh, to have in general. And with that said, going back to this generated modeling business, just think about what we're trying to do there. We're trying to learn a generator distribution, Q theta, that is as close as possible to some underlying data distribution, Px, and a very sound and principled way to go about formalizing this notion is just picking a statistical divergence of your liking and infamizing this divergence over the, the generator's parameters between our truth, Px, and our approximation, Q of theta. Right? 
And so, yeah, first of all, no discriminator here whatsoever, right? This was sort of a heuristic way to measure the quality of our generator that is out the window when you look at things like that. And the uh, amusing fact is that while GANs are actually built based on this Minimax framework we saw in the previous slide, typically this is the idea you start from. And even going back to the 2014 Goodfellow et al. paper that introduced the notion of a GAN, well, the rationale begins at this formulation over here with Jensen Shannon divergence and the role of delta, and then you sort of work your way through variational bounds, arriving at the minimax form that you can actually implement, and then you can you know, conduct an empirical study. But whenever you're solving this minimax form, what you're actually trying to do is to approximately solve this principle in statistical divergence problem over here. Right? And this is in some sense where the magic happens. Because, so it turns out that if you take delta as the one Wasserstein metric that I will define in the next slide, these two perspectives, the one over here and the minimax gain from the previous slide, are not just approximations of one another, but they exactly coincide, which is to a great extent why, uh, I would say, machine learning community believes is the reason behind the fact that Wasserstein GANs, GANs that you build based on the Wasserstein metric, are, yeah, indeed perform so well in practice. So yeah, and that's uh, something that we will talk about from here on out. But to show you what a Wasserstein GAN actually is, I have, of course, give some background about what is a one Wasserstein metric, which falls under this broader framework of optimal transport. But I mean, I will be pretty specific in the way I describe things, uh, just in the context of what I'm going to use or not. All right. Good. So to set up the one Wasserstein metric between two d-dimensional distributions P and Q, I need two main ingredients. The first of which is this set pi of PQ, a set of all couplings of our two distributions, P and Q, where a coupling should be thought of as a joint distribution that has our P and Q as its marginals. You can think of this as the set of all joint laws satisfying some marginal constraints, like it's something that looks like in this illustrated picture over here. Um, yeah, maybe I'll mention that if you look through optimal transport literature, you'll see that Couplings are typically referred to as transportation plans for the reason that, well, roughly speaking, you can think of a coupling as a randomized mapping of a random variable with distribution P onto a random variable with distribution Q. Right? So this is sort of the source of this transportation name um, for this theory, and that's ingredient number one. Right? Second thing we need is to pick a cost, which again could be a pretty general object under the broad framework, but I will focus solely on this Euclidean distance between x and y, which again should be interpreted as what I'm paying for transporting the mass that P has at x to uh, the corresponding mass of Q at point y. And with these two definitions in place, here is the one Wasserstein metric W1 between P and Q is just the infimum over all possible couplings of P and Q of our expected transportation cost in x and y, where x should be thought of as marginally having p as a distribution, and the same rules for y. Right? Yeah, okay, so one Wasserstein, you know, in general, Wasserstein metric is a super deep mathematical concept. You can easily teach a couple of courses just on that. But the bare minimum I feel that I would like to mention here is, first of all, I think it has a cool sort of operational or intuitive interpretation, if you will, which, um, roughly speaking, is minimizing the work in transporting one uh, distribution onto another, which should be imagined as, right, you have these two piles of sand normalized in their mass to be just, you know, have mass one. The first shape has distribution P as it's defining, uh, uh, defining its shape. The first, uh, the second pile of sand has distribution Q defining its shape. And you basically want to start moving mass around while minimizing work so as to reshape this initial P-shaped pile of sand into your target Q-shaped. So that's, uh, I think, a pretty intuitive and insightful way to think about it. But yeah, much more importantly, let me mention two uh, slightly more formal properties. The first of which that the Wasserstein metric is completely robust to support this match. Meaning that even if the supports of P and Q are not intersecting, right, intersecting is an empty set, W1PQ is still a finite meaningful number that quantifies the distance between them as opposed to many other uh, statistical divergences, for example, f-divergences, 
if you have mismatch support, it tends to either explode to infinity or become vacuous, which is extremely important if that's generative modeling you're thinking about, right? Because you can sort of believe that at least in the first epochs of training of my system, my approximating distribution and the truth should have very, should have very little to do with one another, let alone having the same support, and this robustness will keep you from bumping into a bunch of pathologies during this training process. So that's one good property you have. Um, while the second thing I want to mention is for me the most important thing about the Wasserstein metric, it actually deserves its name. It's a metric on the space of probability measures, which unlocks all these tools that I mentioned in the previous slide. And yeah, in fact, something slightly more even happens here. You can show that the Wasserstein metric captures a very specific notion of convergence of probability measures called the star uh, convergence or narrow convergence sometimes, but I will uh, yeah, not get into that right now. So basically that is uh, the way I would like us to think about the one All right. And with this, we're basically one step away from seeing what a Wasserstein GAN actually is. And this one step goes through a very famous result in optimal transport literature called the kantorovich rubich state duality, which allows us to equivalently represent W1PQ in the following dual form as the supremum over Lipschitz 1 functions of the expected value with respect to P of our function minus the expected value of that function with respect to Q. And looking at this dual form, and sort of going back to the minimax game formulation of GANs we started from, I think you really start to feel and sense the, the, the similarity between the two, uh, where, you know, and, and you just basically need to do some recasting. And let me show you what this, the recasting one needs to do. So let me just call P, Px, thus making X my true or real data sample, right? Let me call Q this Q sub X G sub theta, making this Y variable just my fake sample. And finally, let me recast F, the function, as D sub P is my discriminator network, which is now imposed with satisfying this Lipschitz 1 restriction. But upon just renaming with this dictionary over here, if you think about the two perspectives, generated modeling we've been talking about, infamizing a statistical divergence, in this case, the Wasserstein distance that has this particular dual form, and the minimax game formulation used to actually build GANs, you see that the two are exactly the same. Right. And the thing is that, I mean, the only thing that really changes from the ori original minimax game I showed you uh, at the beginning is that now that you, now you need to add this Lipschitz 1 restriction on your generator network, and I'm sort of dismissing this fact, but it's actually not clear until today how to do this in the right way, and there's a bunch of techniques out there, none of them is really superior to all the others, so there is a question of how to actually enforce Lipschitzness of this function over here, but putting that aside, you see that infamizing W1, again, up to the fact that we're parameterizing a super function, I mean, if you believe in global approximation of these neural networks, it shouldn't be too costly, uh, if W1 is in soup, in soup of this discriminated uh, difference over here, and uh, beyond being a neat mathematical correspondence, the thing is that when you actually use one of these suboptimal ways of enforcing, enforcing literatureness and train a generated ne adversarial network, while doing so, empirically, your generated sample just vastly improves. Right? So there is something behind the fact that the minimax formulation uh, with the Lipschitz restriction actually exactly solve an in statistical divergence formulation or for a very meaningful and well-behaved statistical divergence, which is the Wasserstein model. Yes, why do approximate? Yeah, because again, you're basically supervising over the entire space of Lipschitz functions over here, but here I'm sort of parametrizing this function oh, okay. with the neural network. So I mean, I do have some slackness in, in this, you know, saying exactly, but up to this, um, we're pretty close. Right, and, uh, so, I mean, you see that, and that almost gives you the feeling of, okay, problem solved, just figure out how to implement uh, the Lipschitz 1 restrictions and we're done, just do Wasserstein guns uh, from now and, and do forever, which, I mean, would have been the case in a perfect world, but I guess you knew the world was not perfect before I came along. Uh, and the thing is that there is another problem that I was sort of sweeping under the rug, the rug while describing this theory over here that one should not overlook. And the problem is the following. Well. Right. Our actual objective is 
our actual goal is to infamize over this, the generator's parameters this Wasserstein metric between the true data distribution and uh, its approximation that we're trying to learn. The thing is that in reality, and yeah, when I say reality, I mean data science, we never actually have access to PX. Right? So if this is our PX, what we're only getting is IID samples from that distribution, which we are usually using in order to produce some empirical version of that, which sort of inherently limits us to work with this empirical approximation of the true Wasserstein metric, rather than the, with the real Wasserstein metric we're interested in. And at the bottom of our hearts, we're sort of hoping that, well, you know, if my data set is rich enough, if n is large enough, then despite the fact that I'm infamizing this empirical guy, hopefully I'm not too far off from infamizing the true one uh, that is my center of interest. And yeah, this hopefulness, in some sense, reveals perhaps the greatest weakness of the Wasserstein metric framework, which dates back to the late 60s, a result by Dudley that by now got the sketchy name of the curse of dimensionality. It basically says that, yes, your empirical approximation error goes to zero as n goes to infinity, but the rate at which this happens deteriorates drastically with dimension, uh, with this rate being this n to the minus 1 over d uh, right here. And, you know, talking of rate, this asymptotic notation usually just try to think of what this result actually means, right? So this asymptotic notation usually hides some huge constant, right? let's say a million. And now even in dimension 20, you're trying to drive a million to be small, say below 0.1, by dividing it by the dth root of the number of samples. Now if d is, I mean, 10 or 20, you don't have to go too far off, n should be ridiculously large to actually do that, right? And this is without saying a word about dimensionality of actual data sets that are out there, data science, I mean, even the toy example, the entry level sort of task of MNIST in, in, in machine learning, right? Dimension is what, roughly 750, something like this. So I mean, this is a big, big bottleneck in applying this theory in a principled way to practice. In being able to back up the system that we're building with useful sample complexity guarantees. Right? This is how many samples you need to use, and that's the performance you have. And I mean, you see this, you might be thinking, okay, so what can we do with that? And the answer is, if, if that's actually W1 you're interested in, then nothing. You can do nothing. This is a fundamental property of how empirical approximation under Wasserstein metric behaves. It goes nowhere. Right? And therefore, the strategy that people uh, sort of adopted in recent years is to try and come up with tweaked Wasserstein metric versions that would hopefully alleviate this horrible rate over here and even maybe give us a bunch of you know, nice properties as a side effect. And the most, I would say, popular such tweaked framework currently out there is the so-called entropic optimal transport framework, which I would like to describe in terms of a general cost function C for a good reason. It will become clear in a few moments. Um, yeah, and to define the epsilon regularized and tropic optimal transport between P and Q, you basically need to add to your expected cost this epsilon mutual formation regularizer with respect to pi, which is defined as the KL divergence between a joint distribution pi, <coughs> a joint distribution pi, and the product of its marginals, which are P and Q, uh, because pi is a couple. Question about the previous boundary. Right? Sure. So is that for every dimension there exists a distribution where yeah, so in fact, okay, so I'll say a few words. First of all, I'll answer your question in a second. This is tied for d um, 3 and above, right? You get 1 over the square root n for d equals 1 and the log factor in, 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 in dimension 2. Now, as far as what distribution actually attain this uh, rate, well, you don't need to go too far. For instance, if you take your space as d dimensional hypercube, you take uniform distribution, this is the rate you get. In fact, every measure that is absolutely I mean, it's not like a pathological choice of P that throws you off to this uh, regime. This is uh, inherently how uh, this quantity is. P is supported on some low dimensional surface. Right, so they are results, so that's a good point. They are results uh, sort of, you know, imposing more structure on P uh, in terms of some effective dimension, if you will, and prove that the rate you're getting is this thing just with D replaced with this effective dimension. 
right? So you, so you can do that. The question is, you know, I give you a distribution or I give you samples from a distribution. Do you really know what this effective dimension is? Right? But yeah, these are all uh, valid. Um, any more questions? Yes. I have a question. So based on all this distribution of robust literature, they were saying, well, we use Wasser scheme to itself create a ball to deal with you know, uncertainty that you have this empirical measure and you want to be kind of robust in some sense. But here the Wasser scheme is itself the primitive object. What do you mean by that? In other words, I mean, uh, okay, right, in a lot of these usually robust literature, they would say, the primitive object does not have Wasser scheme. I mean, the fundamental problem you're trying to solve, we introduce Wasser scheme to create kind of a robust aspect to the problem where we say, we want to look at a small ball of measures around the With empirical measure. And so it's, are there approaches out there that are doing effectively Wasser scheme on top of the Wasser scheme in some sense? Is that, <laughs> which would be what one might think would, would, would be uh, how that community would think of, or does that make sense, the question? So but maybe uh, to really understand what you're asking, we should talk about that. Okay. I mean, I, but I have some feeling that this Gaussian smooth version that I'll introduce to an extent uh, maybe answers or addresses okay. the question you are asking. But I mean, so I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. If you allow some slackness around P or what? Well, what I'm saying is, I, I guess in this distribution of robust communities, I guess we would say as well, you don't want to optimize just with respect to the empirical thing because it can do badly. Mm -hmm. What we instead do is frame a min-max where we, oh. the max is over all measures in a ball okay. around the empirical measure and you solve that. But then okay. I'm thinking that's, since for you, the original problem has Wasserstein in it, yes. here would be like a Wasserstein on top of a Wasserstein or something. Like okay, so I, I... Does that make... I mean, it's a little vague, but it could be more precise. Yeah, let me try and I sure. just tell me if it answers what you want. So, I mean, w one good question here, and maybe this is uh, to an extent your, your meaning here, is that, I mean, this is sort of the vanilla empirical approximation of P, right? And what I'm doing here is effectively plugging it in. This is the plug-in estimator of W1, if you will, with respect to this empirical... Uh, measure and one could potentially say, look, maybe I can be smarter about picking this p hat over here. Like maybe I can do some uh, current dust estimation, employ some current dust estimation technique, or do some other fancy, uh, use some other fancy method, and potentially improve this rate. Right. So it turns out that doing anything beyond plug-in uh, won't change the rate. Um, yeah, in a very general sense, and at most it will buy you a log factor in the convergence this rate. So I mean, this is again pretty. Uh, fundamental behavior. I'm not sure uh, okay. if this is what you might be looking for. Good. Um, anything else? Right. So entropic OT, right, which uh, is, like I said, basically adding to your expected cost this epsilon mutual formation regularizer defined in, in, in the usual way. Mutual formation is scale divergence between a joint and a product of its marginals. And to understand what we gain from that, we have to have a certain sense of what mutual formation actually does. And, uh, well, mutual formation is this fundamental measure of dependence between random variables. For instance, it will nullify if and only if your random variables are independent. So, in a sense, by adding this regularizer, what we're doing is that while optimizing over the space of all possible couplings, we're starting to favor weakly dependent couplings only. Right, which are typically much simpler and easier to find. And what I mean by easier to find can be sort of further observed by the fact that this regularizer is strongly convex in pi, thus transforming this initially a fine optimization problem into a strongly convex one, which is super useful if that's algorithms you're worried about. Worried about. And indeed, uh, there are some very, very fast way to actually compute the job transport transport that <coughs> avoid the strong uh, convexity of uh, the objective function over here, but at least as far as the crystal dimensionality discussion goes, the most important thing I would like to say about it is that two sample statistical approximation under a tropic OT indeed goes or converges to zero at a rate which, which is much faster than the Dudley rate, and this is the benchmark result here from last year, uh, yeah, from my, okay, depends from where you're uh, which says that the two sample empirical approximation error under OT, if you just overlook this prefactor over here, for all dimensions converges as n to the minus half, which is way faster than this n to the minus d we saw before for the unregularized version. Now, if you don't overlook this prefactor, you see that it uh, is still exponential in d, but it depends pretty horribly on epsilon. 
But I mean, it's a much milder exponential dependence that we have than we had uh, for the n to minus one over d ring uh, of the previous slide. And uh, I mean, this is pretty good news, I think. Uh, but there are two main things that I want to uh, sort of say about this result. First is, well, what I mean by two sample statistical approximation is that the question we're basically asking here is how fast does entropic OT between p hat and q hat, two empirical virgin, versions, goes towards the entropic OT between p and q, the actual distributions that produce the samples from which these empirical uh, versions were constructed, right? So this is a slightly weaker sense of statistical approximation than the one I was referring to before, but that's not a big deal. What's more important here is that this result, and in fact, any follow-up on that that came later is, at least as of now, only proven under the assumption that our cost function is infinity, infinitely continuously differentiable function, which um, in particular, and this sort of brings me to the bad news part of entropic OT, because the C-infinity restriction in particular excludes distance costs, right? And at least for me, any uh, tweaked, I would say, optimal transport framework should at least be able to account for the simplest Wasserstein metric out there, which is W1, and uh, at least as far as empirical approximation goes, entropic optimal transport is incapable of doing that. Okay, um, second item, which I kind of alluded to at the beginning, is the fact that going from classic optimal transport to entropic one, you fundamentally lose your metric structure. And first thing you can notice that entropic optimal transport between P and P, P and Q are the same, is in general not zero because of this regular rise over here, which could be effectively fixed by massaging this quantity into a so-called synchron divergence or synchron loss, loss though you will still not get a metric because, for instance, signal divergence will not satisfy the triangle. So you fundamentally lose this metric structure that we like so much about the Wasserstein metric. Um, and yeah, on top of that, looking at the dual form of this thing, you see this uh, representation over here, which, first of all, noticeably involves optimization over two potentials, two functions, u and v, as opposed to a single Lipschitz one function that we had for original w1, of which we really like thinking about as our discriminator network. So this sort of goes out the window. And maybe, you know, even in some sense uh, weirder is this regularizer that pops up here that I don't know personally how to interpret. And all in all, I would say that this dual form sort of steers this entropic framework away from being compatible to how we actually go about building generated adversarial networks. Okay, so I mean, all in all, I would say that this is a beautiful idea. It's super useful for many different things, but if you want to think about applications to GANs, this might not be the best uh, framework to have. Okay. So I mean, is the obvious question to you, how does it compare in practice? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, so I, I don't know of actually any implementations. I, I know of one paper that sort of implemented again based on entropic optimal transport. I wouldn't call the results you know, super convincing. Um, but I mean, that, that's for these main reasons, I would say it's not very popular uh, for a building again. But it does, I mean, the reason I wanted to present it is, is especially this result over here. So you worry about the curse of dimensionality. Well, here's one way to sort of deal with that, right? But this particular way maybe uh, might not be what you want to adopt if you want to. Yes. Question, sir. Uh, so yes. 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 Pair of discriminator functions, right? One works for the real ones, one works for. Uh, I mean, uh, by yeah. default, this the parameters would involve both, right? Or, like, is there something about the design which implements a single function mm -hmm. that you try to tune both? No, 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 you're right, you're right. That's, that's, that's a fair point. Yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah, this basically brings me to uh, this Gaussian school uh, optimal transport framework, uh, which I would argue is a much more sort of compelling solution to the problem, again, for the particular GAN application that I'm sort of um, building this thing around. And to start off, the definition here is super simple. Um, Gaussian smooth optimal transport, GOT for shirts, you pick a smoothing parameter sigma, 
right, non-negative number, and you just define your W1 of sigma between PQ simply as the regular W1, but between P and Q after they are convolved with d-dimensional isotropic Gaussian measures of parameter sigma. Right? So that's that's all. The regular W1 just between slightly perturbed distributions. And to maybe get some uh, intuition behind what this convolution is actually doing, let me uh, take P or sorry x and y as random variables having distributions P and Q and z1 and z2 as variables that follow this Gaussian law over here, right? And remind ourselves from basic probability that if x and z1, for instance, are independent, then their sum is distributed exactly according to this convolution between p and n. Same goes for y and z2. So in a sense, what I'm doing here is saying, look, think of x and y as signals having distributions p and q. Regular Wasserstein would measure distance in the signal space. Now, instead of that, my proposal is take your signals, pass them to an additive white Gaussian noise channel by adding these z1 and z2 variables over here and measure Wasserstein at the output space. Right? Now, if you're willing to do that, measuring Wasserstein at the output instead of measuring Wasserstein in the input, you will get a bunch of nice properties. And in particular, get rid of the crystal. So like I'm saying, it's regular W1 just between these perturbed versions of our distributions, and the smoothing name comes from the fact that when you blow up sigma, um, your distribution becomes smoother, but in some sense you should not overdo it, right? Because you're sort of drowning your signal in, in noise, and you should really think of sigma as some hyperparameter, which should be carefully choosing. I want to introduce smoothness, but I don't want to sort of overshoot it so as is that my original signals are basically gone. Um, yeah, and with that said, the first nice thing about um, GOT is that it doesn't lose this very simple and nice compatibility to GANs just because it's a regular W1 between those perturbed distributions. So you can just as well apply Kantarovic Schuberstein duality, get this soup Lipschitz function uh, dual nice form with the only difference. Should I? I'm at that. I don't have a one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking. All right. Um, the only difference here is that now you add to your real and fake samples this uh, Gaussian perturbation over here, which in particular means that any GAN implementation out there adopted for regular W1 is basically trivially modified or can be trivially modified to accommodate GOT instead. Right? You just sample with. And this is a pretty, I mean, not naive, I would say, way to, to go about it. There's much structure here to be exploited, and I will say a few words about that going forward. But the very least, you know, everything that is already implemented uh, could be uh, just, you know, pulled into this framework as well. So you don't lose this compatibility, which is nice. The second thing that you don't lose is you don't lose your metric structure. as formulated in this simple theorem. For any sigma, W1 of sigma is still a metric on the space of probability measures, and in fact it captures or metrizes the exact <coughs> same notion of convergence as the original W1. Uh, and yeah, so I won't prove this thing, but to at least give you a flavor of why should you sort of, you know, believe that this is true, the idea is really to start looking at everything through characteristic functions, like the time as follows, for distribution B. Because characteristic functions behave very nicely under convolutions. What happens is that characteristic function of convolution is just a product of characteristic functions. And taking into effect that characteristic function of a Gaussian has a closed form solution that is never zero, you can, in some sense, just cancel the effect of this convolution from your entire metric analysis and show that GOT yeah, sort of just inherits all its metric properties from the fact that regular W1 is the metric. Right? This is basically what happens here. Uh, and as a nice corollary, you can uh, show that GOT, a sequence of distributions, will converge to a limiting distribution under GOT if and only if it converges under regular W1, which could be further sort of verbalized just by saying that the Wasserstein topology right, doesn't change, uh, is invariant, if you will, to this convolution of Gaussians, or the topology induced by GOT and W1 is exactly the same. All right. So good, you don't lose uh, compatibility or nice dual form, I would say it. You don't lose metric structure. And another nice thing that happens here is that you get a very, very well-behaved function of sigma. And this is how the game is played. So you fix P and Q, and you ask, well, how does this thing behave when I start changing sigma? Right? And first thing I would say uh, is, well, you get a continuous monotonic and non-increasing function of sigma. And it's not negative variable of yours. As a special case of item one, 
when you drive sigma to zero, you retrieve the original GOT, which is a nice I mean, sanity check to, uh, yeah, to, to, to perform. Uh, and the third bullet is kind of surprising, I think, which uh, addresses the question of, well, what would happen if I would drive sigma to infinity? Any guesses? So you convolve your distribution with an infinitely fat Gaussian. What happens? So at least my uh, wrong initial guess was that the distance would go to zero. Turns out that this is in general not the case. And I will show you a simple example of the is this one to zero uh, in just a second. But let me just say that at least for proving this uh, first bullet, what we use is the stability lemma over here that effectively sandwiches GOT with parameter sigma one between two GOTs with parameter sigma two, which is larger, right, up to this correction term that depends on the square root of their square distances, which should be understood as, I mean, yeah, not a lot changes if you just change sigma by a little bit. And once you prove this thing using Kutarovich uh, and duality, you can effectively establish continuity and monotonicity, get uh, item two as a special case. And uh, as far as this third item, so yeah, intuitively, uh, maybe one should think that, well, you convolve with, or you add, an infinite amount of noise, signals are gone. But yeah, as a counterexample, you can just take the rock measures. You take two point masses at two different points, right? What happens when you convolve a point mass with a Gaussian? You just shift your Gaussian, so effectively GOT becomes W1 between two Gaussians with different centers. And I'll just use um, yeah, convexity of norm and genesis of equality, push the expectation into the uh, norm, canceling the effect of the coupling, right? Just because of linearity, and then you're uh, left with uh, the normal x minus y, which is not zero by assumption. So I mean, I'm, I'm still pretty sure that you can impose mild regularity assumptions on p and q, maybe that they have densities and will get this equality to zero, but in general, this is not the case. Yes? So how, how does this relate to the original, more naive kind of bad thing you said about we just have the empirical measures, with the thinking being, well, the empirical measure is the truth in plus a Gaussian by some limit laws, if n is really large, so the, in other words, if the samples between p hat and q hat were originally coupled, then is this that would give you that they're both the truth plus a Gaussian, right? Um, I'm just saying if p hat is your empirical measure, then in the space of measures, just by some kind of limit law, when n is large, it is true measure plus some kind of Gaussian, right? Yes, but you know, so is that I mean, the, so this is that would be. A, the special case of this, the original thing? So, I don't know, the, the way I would think, and I will get, okay, I will get to empirical approximation, basically, the, that's the next thing I want to talk okay. about, but the way you should maybe think about, about this is that um, you actually already know that your problem has some structure, right? Yeah. And uh, if you just now, like you did before, plug in p hat into, instead of p into w1, right. what you're basically doing is trying to approximate a smooth version of this p with a Gaussian mixture model. Right. You just convolve an empirical measure with a Gaussian, you basically wrap a Gaussian around your sample. But I'm saying the empirical measure itself is the truth plus a Gaussian just by the laws of probability, right? Um, yeah, possibly so. I, yeah, so okay. Yeah. But that Gaussian is not regularized, it's anti-regularized. Right? Well, that's what I was, I was wondering, what's the, cause it, but it, it would be some special case of this framework. Right? I think that, that, that Gaussian that's being added is not independent of the original thing. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Yes. Question: Is this the convergence is if and only if? Why is the only of so if sigma is large, it feels like even if the function converge, oh sorry, even if the distribution doesn't converge, I would think yes. it does. So yeah, basically you're asking, why do I know? that if yeah. this thing converges, this implies that this thing converges. The if and only if, but it feels like if you're saying it's a thick sigma. Yeah, yeah, what's, so what you're, you're asking, about which direction you're asking? Going from here to here, I know that this happens, why does this happen? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. right, yeah. so just think of this as regular W1. Right? Sure. Now, W1 convergence is equivalent to weak star convergence. Sure. So you have weak star convergence of P and convolved with a Gaussian, Right, to be convolved with the Gaussian, just by W1 rules, right? 
And then you use the fact that, again, you go to characteristic function, basically weak star convergence is equivalent to point-wise convergence of characteristic functions, and cancel away the effect of the Gaussian just as you did in the metric analysis. All right. So, where are we? Yes, here, I think. So a nicely behaved function of sigma, and in fact, it's even nicer than this uh, one slide uh, suggests. And to show you sort of what I mean by even nicer, I want to sort of try and reinterpret the second bullet over here. That uh, on one hand, it could be understood, well, you drive sigma to zero, you get back down to one, great. Another way to understand it is just recalling that both GOT and W1 are, in fact, optimization problems, right? You infamize over couplings a certain expected cost. And with this in mind, interpret the second bullet as saying, well, take a sequence of GOT optimization problems and think about the optimal value of this sequence of optimization problem. Item number two says that the sequence of optimal values converges towards the optimal value of the limiting problem. Yes? Now what I mean by, by even more happens here is that it so turns out that optimizers converge as well. Okay? And this is uh, what happens. So indeed, let me take a sequence sigma k that goes down to some limiting sigma, could be zero, which would correspond to our item number two, could be uh, just other positive limiting point. And now for any k, extract a coupling pi k, which is optimal for the k GOT optimization problem. Right? Good, now I've got a sequence of couplings, then one could ask, well, does the sequence, up to extraction of subsequences, does the sequence converge somewhere, and if so, where? Well, it turns out that under this weak star topology, pi k indeed goes to pi, again, up to extractions of subsequences, and this limiting pi is not only a coupling between the limiting measures, in fact, it's an optimal coupling for the limiting GOT problem, which is what I mean by, you know, not only optimal values converge, but optimizers converge as well, which in uh, the sigma zero equals zero case says that, well, you take a sequence of Gaussian smooth optimal couplings and drive the sequence to its limit, we'll get an optimal coupling for the unsmooth PNQ distribution. Right? Now proving this thing requires some heavier machinery, so you need some techniques from uh, calculus of variation topology, but I will not get into that. Uh, and instead, let me, on top of the, you know, nice dual form and metric structure in this well-behaved dependence on sigma, let me talk about sort of the main piece of business here, with this, which is the statistical efficiency, because like I promised, cursor dimensionality is basically out the window when you convolve with Gaussian in a very strong and broad sense, by the way. And here is the result. So for any dimension and any smoothing, positive smoothing parameter, right, the expected value of your approximation error decays at this optimal n to the minus half rate, again, with a prefactor that is exponential in dimension, sigma is sort of playing this, a similar role to what epsilon played in the entropic OT result, though I would say that dependence on sigma here is better than what we had for epsilon there, and I can uh, offline show you what I mean by that. And the framework under which this result holds is pretty broad. And here's what I mean by that. First of all, this uh, result accounts for any sub-Gaussian distribution B as opposed to entropic OT that only sort of works, or at least the proof works for compact supported distribution. It further turns out that Gaussian kernels are not even necessary. It is sufficient to convolve your P and, and P hat distribution with sub-Gaussian noise under some, that satisfies some, some uh, regularity and smoothness assumptions, so I would say. So you can go beyond Gaussian convolutions. And uh, on top of that, this notion of empirical approximation is actually pretty strong in the sense that when you get this expected W1 of sigma between P hat and P to converge, we in particular control the one sample version with the same rate that we sort of give care about for GANs, as well as the two sample version uh, that entropic OT accounts for, and basically on and on saying that uh, curse of dimensionality, again, you convolve with Gaussians and you get rid of the entry minus one for Is there a sense in which convolving is it algorithmically nicer? Yeah, so this is, uh, I will comment on that in a second. Yes. So just maybe to summarize. Do you, you want to ask me? Yeah, sure. Yes. So do you have a bound between W1 sigma and W1? Yes. Well, so they converge, sure, but. Sure, uh, sure. No, but you won't improve on them. That's what you're shooting for. Well, uh, that's, no, I mean, basically, that's a special case of this before. 
right? Take uh, sigma one and zero, sigma two is something, yes, 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 yes. and then we'll get. Uh, yeah, and I w when I saw this, I at some point saw, thought, well, what happens if you sort of drive sigma to zero at a proper rate, right? Can you actually beat this uh, into the minus one? Yeah, no, it's fine, but just yeah. it depends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, and I mean maybe this is not true. I don't know. Maybe it could be better. Or we're getting back to that. Yeah. Okay, so let me just conclude uh, by saying that, you know, I started this uh, talk by, uh, with the sentence of, well, Gaussian smoothing will uh, keep the properties you like about uh, GOT and alleviate the curse of dimensionality. So at least, hopefully now we have a very precise understanding of what this uh, initially vague sentence means. And going forward, what I sort of like to envision here is that this would actually open the door to, in some sense, the next generation gang constructions that would hopefully be competitive in their performance to the systems that are currently out there, but will be able to attain this performance while consuming significantly fewer resources, while, which is at least for me even more important than that, being backed up or coupled with useful sample complexity guarantees that again would allow us to make claims as well, this is the amount of data you should be using, and with this data that's the performance you're going to get. And let me just say that some of these results I've presented are sort of fresh out of the oven. They're like two weeks old or something like this. So it's a very much ongoing work with multiple trajectories we're exploring. The main of which, I mean, I, I wish I had results to show you on that, is the empirical one. For some people, I say it would be the main of which. You should take GOT, build a gun based on that, start sampling it, and check what are the quality of the samples you're getting. And this is in the works where, uh, yeah, as we speak, working on implementing this thing, and I mean, whoever is curious, I will be happy to update them once we get there. Uh, of course, there's the algorithmic framework that uh, you've mentioned. Beyond, I mean, just adapting in a naive way algorithms that are already out there, we're trying to think about enhanced algorithms that are sort of tailored for this GOT framework that exploit this Gaussian convolution structure we have here, uh, which really smoothens out this problem and you know, hopefully will allow us to prove that uh, such enhanced algorithms exist and back them up again with theoretical guarantees. And of course, there's a bunch of interesting uh, statistical questions to explore, such as, well, with the limited distribution of this empirical process, for instance, uh, some hypothesis testing under the GOT framework, as well as a bunch of other stuff. So, yeah, maybe I'll just, you know, skip the uh, summary in the favor of time, because I think I'm, yeah, just on spot and maybe to allow a few questions. Uh, guys, thanks a lot for uh, listening. I really enjoyed it. And I'm happy to take questions. I have a couple in inverse order of appearance that will betray my ignorance here. Um, you were talking about the convergence of the optimizers, the pies. Mm. Is there one pi that optimizes? Okay, so in general, no. so you're you're saying in some sense if pi is any optimizer for this p and then any optimizer and any optimizer and everything. No, I'm saying that you go ahead and pick a sequence of optimizers which might be non-unique for right. a sequence of problems. Yep. Right? I can extract a subsequence of your Got sequence okay. that will converge to some point. There exists a point at which it converges, but whatever this point is, there's a coupling between the limiting measures yeah. and it's optimal. Okay, so right. it's a subsequence kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Second question is, uh, you said the metric, we lose the metric structure we like so much when we use this thing here as opposed to this thing yeah. 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 Um, why do we like the metric structure so much? Is it is it because it metrizes specifically that weak star topology so we can turn it into a problem of a e of p of f of x? Yeah, so I mean, weak star topology, the, the way I, you know, like to sort of justify why it is maybe the right topology to consider if you think about convergence of probability measures is because it's the only notion of convergence that actually under which empirical measures goes towards, uh, towards p, right? I mean, every other stronger notion of convergence, uh, under some assumptions on your uh, limiting or you know data generating distribution, you will not get convergence over here. So uh, that's one thing I would say. You know, capturing this notion of convergence is important. On top of that, I mean, you know, metric space, uh, all your sort of intuition for uh, geometry of distances applies, and this is pretty useful when you are analyzing systems that are. Based Fair on enough. System. Yeah. Okay. And final, final question. This is really quick. Um, the optimal GAN for a given data set, right? 
Well, Obviously, when, when you have a, when you have different data sets, you'll have different candidates. Is there is there any kind of theory about the, uh, others might know the answer to this? Like like is there some kind of universal GAN that that is really good on some huge family of data set? You know, when you solve the minimax problem, you get a similar. Yeah, I mean, this uh, first of all, this GAN literature is is really. I, I mean, the pace at which it. I've never yeah. read any of it, so I it don't goes. It's really hard to follow everything that's, that's out there. I, I could <laughs> say, say that you know, one of the changes best every two weeks. Like. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Can you? Madeline says state of the art changes every two weeks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, sorry, question. Um, that's it for me. So yeah, I would, I, what I can say is maybe you know one one um, construction that is currently out there that uh, at least you know produces these images at the beginning and in general is perceived as being pretty good is this notion of progressively growing GANs where you start from very small uh, generator discriminant network, you train these, you wrap them up in a larger uh, generator discriminant, you train these, you keep on going like this until you get something that is sufficiently expressive and it gives you uh, some very nice samples. But I mean, I, you read these papers, right, and you see these empirical results, they only publish the good ones. So you never, you never really know, right? You never really know where this particular method completely broke down and wasn't capable of, of, of tracking the actual idea. So, uh, for uh, empirically fitting uh, uh, deep learning models, especially on um, on images, there are a lot of standard tricks for augmenting your training set. Um, these are things like for images, uh, getting translations of them, rotations of them. Um, can you view uh, convolution with Gaussians as a particular um, kind of transformation on your training set? Um, like, does this correspond to like yeah. noising your images with random Gaussian noise? Yeah, for I, th I, th I think you could. Um, it, so, it, it, I mean, yeah, it, okay. So I, I mean, I know this literature is vast, but is that something that, yeah, yeah. that so, people do? Or? I would say the following. First of all, I think that one data augmentation method that is out there is just by adding Gaussian. Which is basically this, yeah. right? Now, uh, the other thing that maybe uh, I would say here is that, um, okay, so you, you think of that, right? You want to do... Um, You want to solve this, right? Now, this is for you to design, right? So I just sort of want to propose another way to think about what would a GOT GAN would actually mean, right? So this is for you to design. If you want, you can, in particular, just convolve this distribution with the Gaussian curve. Again, it's up to you, right? Okay. And now, what? Uh, and you don't know Px, right? So you have to replace it with something. And what I'm saying is, well, instead of doing like. Vanilla empirical approximation, right? Then take this vanilla empirical approximation, turn it into a GMM with the same kernel width, and plug that in instead of your PX. Right? So maybe this is another way to understand. The sample what, from that distribution, I, I do just, right, I can do that by sampling from my empirical distribution and then adding dash and Yes. Noise. Yes, yeah. exactly. So I mean, yeah, so I guess the main difference is actually on the on the on the second term. Yeah, yeah. So I'm saying, yeah, you you will sort of think of your uh, generated distribution uh, not as what you're actually getting, but as a slightly sort of seen. Sure. Um, so it's meant to be some sense in which there's a suggestion of affordable in terms of density. Just you're trying to learn just has more to be. Like the world consists um, of the numbers one through ten, right? And like two dimensions, you have like a hundred degrees of freedom, and like ten and one, and then a thousand and three, and so on. So you're trying to learn more parameters fundamentally at the dimensional rows. So it's something you just sort of would naturally expect next to the of the dimensional Sure, races. sure. And this is, so, I mean, where is my. So you can still see that you pay for dimension over here, right? So, so for dimension, you pay for smaller. Smoothness parameter. Right, yeah. So, so, so um, how is this addressing the person question? How do that? We still have like okay because the way this depends on dimension is compared to n to the minus one over d dependence on dimension is is a I mean there's a major difference. Just think about this in some log log scale, right? What would you see in dimension 100 for Dudley? You would see a slope of what minus one over 100, right? Which what would you see here? You would see a slope of a minus half, and maybe you would have some discrepancy for small values of n, where it, which is where your uh, constant will sort of dominate, but if n is large, you will see a big difference in how uh, this quantity converges as opposed to the other small positive. It's for constant sigma, right? Sure, sure. Yeah.
No, no, everything. Yeah, you, you, okay, you go back to that bound, sigma is 1 over d, and then it becomes bad. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. If you, if you take sigma, if you shrink sigma with n as well, which is basically I think what you're saying, right? Well, with d, because you have the bound, right, which actually is d times the square of sigma squared, so d has to be 1 over, I mean, sigma has to be 1 over d. Yes. And then you end up with d to the d. Sure. Here. But no, no, shrinking sigma will right. definitely kill this thing. This is for a fixed thing. Okay. Okay. Thank you.